Hello, hello, everyone. As everyone kind of rolls on in, we'll give them a couple minutes. Hi, Donna. Okay, and I saw lots of familiar names on our registration list. So I'm excited to have people join us again. And then uh, this will also be recorded, posted to our YouTube um, as well. For those that can't, can't attend live, we will have it on YouTube. Um, we had lots of great audience questions sent in for the Ask a Trainer Anything uh, section that we'll do. Um, so first we'll kind of go through um, the topic of winter fun, some activities to do with your dogs when it's gross outside. Um, I live in the Seattle area, so in the winter it gets really rainy and, and just soggy. Um, sometimes we get snow, so a lot of the times I don't wanna go outside for long walks. So you'll get some ideas of what I do with my dogs to keep them busy. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up for uh, full Ask a Trainer Anything questions. Mia will help me um, go through the questions sent in ahead of time, um, but then we'll also pepper in some of the live questions if you have them. So feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of the screen, should be in the center of your screen. Um, if you have a question about the winter fun activities, pop that in the chat when I'm talking about it. And then when we open it up for Q&A time, um, you can put your question there. We do ask that everyone stays on mute just throughout the main topics. When we get into Q&A, we might ask you to unmute if we're talking about your dog uh, to get more info. And then feel free to turn your video on if you're comfortable uh, with that. We love seeing our friends and then their puppies and their dogs as well. I kind of get distracted sometimes when there's a dog on screen, so, <laughs> but I love it. So feel free to share your pupper on screen with us. And I did want to go through a couple quick like housekeeping and announcements, um, something that I'm really excited about. Let me find it here, which is starting in 2021 our book club that we're starting. I have wanted to do this for a long time. Um, I am a big reading nerd. I actually have a master's degree in writing. So, <laughs> um, so I am excited to combine my love of reading and writing with um, my love of dogs. So I invite you to join our new dog book club. It's gonna be starting in January, uh, start of the new year. We'll meet twice monthly and our first book that I picked is Bones Would Rain From the Sky. Um, and it is a classic uh, book. It really talks a lot about dog training and behavior and how uh, our relationships can be strengthened with really easy just shifts in thinking. So twice a month, we'll meet really casual, probably drink some wine on my end um, and kind of talk about some insights I have about these books, share stories and just hang out with other dog nerds. Um, so if you want to sign up for that and get more info, just go to preventivet.com um, to sign up. And every month we'll be doing a different dog book. We'll all get to vote on which ones we do each month after next month. So I'm super excited for that. I hope you all join me for our book club. And then for attending our Yappy Hour, where we always want to say thank you for spending time with us. Um, we offer a $10 off coupon for attending Yappy Hour to any of our Puppy Essentials workshops that I do. So these are small group workshops live with me, um, usually between two to five people. Um, so you get a lot of personalized training feedback. You get to ask all the questions you have about the different topics that we offer. We have socialization foundations, which is really important now during uh, COVID time uh, to help the new pandemic puppies get started on the right paw. We also offer crate training, potty training, nipping and biting is a big one for a lot of puppy owners. And then for dogs of all ages, we do offer the all about barking workshop where we talk about the different kinds of barking and what you can do to live a quieter life with your dog. So use the code YAPI10 um, at our store. Again, you can go to preventivet.com to sign up for one of those. We have lots of ongoing dates. So there's usually one coming up really quickly. Okay. So, sorry, my puppy wants to say hi. You can see how big he is now. A lot of you saw him when he was a little potato and now he's ginormous. He's as big as his aunt. She's, she's a little heavier, but he's just as long. So he'll be much bigger than her. Yeah, I'm good to say hi. That's Fozzie there. Okay, so 
winter activities. In the chat, go ahead and let me know where you're located and if you get lots of rain or lots of snow where you're at. Because I know that a lot of clients, as we get into winter weather, they're looking for things that they can do to keep their dog engaged, to burn off that excess energy without having to go out in the elements, right? Not a lot of people enjoy walking in the rain um, or the snow. And especially when it's icy, it can actually be really dangerous. Um, and then also it's dark during the winter, right? Up here in Seattle, it's already dark now. It got dark at like 4.30 and then it's light again at 7.30. And so it can be dangerous to walk at night with our dogs, especially if you live in a really um, urban area with lots of cars driving around, things like that. So Portland, yep, lots of rain, you know how that is. <laughs> Nashville, yeah, more ice than snow, yeah. And so icy makes it not fun to go for a walk, dangerous for you, dangerous for the dogs, right? Julie, you're in Seattle, Woot. <laughs> Yes, dark, and dark early in the day is the worst. I'm, I feel just more tired during the winter. So I wanted to come up with some ideas for everyone to use to make your life less stressful um, and help your dogs burn that energy so that you're not forced to go out on these walks in the rain and snow and to stay safe. So I'm gonna go through a lot of different um, videos that I have of things that I do with my dogs or other ideas. But overall, what I do when I can't do as much physical exercise as I might normally with the dog, I balance that with more mental enrichment. So lots of brain work um, for the dogs to burn excess energy, right? And you can do a lot of enrichment inside. And it's not always about just using food as enrichment, but that is one of the easiest ways that we can provide more enrichment for our dogs. And so I do a lot of work to eat feeding. My first piece of advice for winter activities for your dog is ditch the food bowl, right? Don't feed your dog or your puppy from a regular bowl anymore. Mix it up, make them work for it a little bit. Couple ideas here and I'll show you. First one I have, it's like a magic hat over here I'm gonna pull stuff out of, is a snuffle mat. <laughs> so I love putting a dog's natural instincts to work and their instinct to sniff, Fozzie's like, you brought out the snuffle mat. <laughs> I wanna work their brain with sniffing. It takes up so much of their brain energy. And so you can use a snuffle mat that you buy. You can also make your own snuffle mats um, and you scatter their kibble within all these little fingers, right? Now in the summer, sometimes I'll do this in grass, right? But we don't have grass in the winter. So making one for indoors works really well. This really extends their meal time from about two minutes, right? To maybe 15, 20 minutes, depends on the dog. And I'll show you a video of Suki, my older dog doing this. And you can see the other snuffle mat that I have at home. I think this one is fun um, music too. I can find it on my screen here. Maybe, there we are. I have too many windows open. <laughs> That's Suki's favorite way to eat actually is with that snuffle mat. 
um, but I have two kinds, right? And I have two dogs, so I get to switch it out with them. You can make your own, like I mentioned, or you can purchase them pre-made. It really just depends on how crafty you feel. That's one option for feeding your dog. Other options include things like topples, using stuffed topples. So these are interactive food puzzles or the classic Kong, right? Again, this is just a way to make your dog burn some extra energy eating their regular meals, right? So they have to work for it. They have to really think about how do I get this kibble out rather than it just being an easy to eat bowl. So it's just one easy way to burn that excess energy during the winter when they can't have as much physical exercise. One thing too, I much prefer the topple to Kongs, especially if you have a younger puppy um, or a dog who might get frustrated with the Kong. Uh, I see this sometimes where it's hard for the dog to actually de-stuff a Kong because it's a smaller opening or they can't get the food down at the very bottom. Um, so I like the larger opening of the topples. They come in two sizes. And you can actually, if you feed just dry kibble, you can pop them together and then they have to roll it around. So it's another kind of puzzle for them. Um, but this is a lot easier for them to access the bottom and not get frustrated and give up uh, with a work to eat toy. Um, it's also easier for me to clean if there is a little bit left versus the Kong, although toothbrushes work really well for this. Both are dishwasher safe, so you can always just pop them in the dishwasher as well. Um, so those are just some work to eat toys that are some great options instead of your dog's regular food bowl. Um, other things for food enrichment, you can really do a lot of DIY stuff. If you happen to have one of these holy rollerball toys um, that they have, you can make this into a food puzzle. So you don't always have to go and buy something that's made for stuffing dog food in. Um, you can get little pieces of fleece or fabric and wrap their kibble in it and then stuff it into this ball. Also treats if you want to do that. I've had some clients who stick bully sticks through this and they make it something that the dog has to destroy, which a lot of dogs love doing um, to get to their food. So that's one way to repurpose another popular toy that's out there. And then something that I'm, a lot of people nowadays have after the toilet paper rush of COVID, toilet paper rolls. <laughs> These super easy DIY enrichment um, for dogs. So you can do, I, I call it the fortune cookie. I don't know why, but you get a couple dog treats. You fold the bottom of this in and you pop the treats in there and then you can fold the top. So they have to work a little bit to get into the treat that's in there. Um, so I will do a couple of these and sometimes I'll make it even harder because I'll put these into a box and then they have to snuffle around the box and get them. So you can start really easy at first and then make it harder for your dog as you go. Um, but toilet paper rolls are really easy. I'll show you another video here of Suki with her food tube puzzle that I made with toilet paper rolls. So all you need is the toilet paper rolls and then um, a shoe box as we go. So, I don't know if the music is playing. Me is telling me there's no music playing. So I'll talk over this. <laughs>
So with Suki, this took her about, I think 10 minutes when we did this in the office with her to just get a few pieces of kibble and a few pieces of treats. Um, so it's a great way to burn energy using things that you have around the house. And I will be sending you a lot of follow-up resources um, that include those videos and how to actually do it step-by-step -step stuff with a lot of other DIY. The last DIY food thing for enrichment to burn some energy and make meal times a little bit more exciting for your dog, you just need a towel. Um, so what I like to do is I put this flat on the ground and I scatter some kibble on it and then I roll it up, right? And so then the dog has to push it and snuffle around in it. It's kind of like a snuffle mat um, tweaked a little bit. This is actually something we do with dogs who are training to um, for the dog sport treble, which is urban herding. Uh, we teach them to push with their nose. So this is a fun one to do with your dog. You have a towel, you have their dry food, easy peasy. So that's one other way to just build some food enrichment for your dog. You want the towel? Good girl. So some other ways to burn energy that aren't food-based. I like to take some outdoor activities and bring them inside, but I have to think about space, right? One thing I like to do with dogs inside is a flirt pole. So I'll grab these here. I have two kinds. So the one I use the most with my dogs, it's like a giant cat toy. Um, at the end is a little like fetch tug toy. <laughs> Plazzy's like, give it to me. Um, and a lot of these, you can actually switch out the toy that's on the end. So you can change it to your dog's favorite toy um, or switch it out when it gets gross and dirty. I like this one, but for indoors, I actually prefer one, I'm going to get it, that has a telescoping handle. So if I was outside, I can make this really long, right? But I'm inside. I want to sit on my recliner or on my couch and still play with a flirt pole with my dog. So I actually bring the handle in close. You can make your own as well. Um, I'll make sure that I include a video uh, to DIY one if you want to make your own, if you're feeling crafty. But you can also just buy these online. It's a great way to actually not have to run around with your dog, but still tire them out and make them run around with your dog, uh, with their toy. This is also a great tool for nipping puppies or teething dogs um, who want to chase and bite things. And so if you want some distance between your hand and your bitey velociraptor, using a flirt pole is a great way to get that energy out and redirect their teeth to something appropriate without your hand being in the way. Um, so that's one thing I really like to do um, indoors to burn energy. Let's see if I have that one. I do not. Oh. Hi, are you just getting into all of my fun stuff? Because it's so fun. It is. Sorry, my puppy's like, all of your examples I want to eat. Good boy. So that's one thing I like to do that you can do outdoors, but bringing it indoors will work. Just make sure you have enough room cleared out for your puppy or your dog to chase the flirt pole with. The other thing you can do is indoor fetch, right? This is especially nice for the dogs who are still learning how to play fetch. So starting indoors is a lot less distracting. I like doing it. We have a hallway in our town home here that works perfectly for this because I can close the doors to all the rooms so he doesn't just fly off <laughs> in somewhere else. And I practice fetch at a short distance first before building it up to the full hallway. One thing I like to do too is make it a little bit of agility where I add in some jumps in the hallway that they have to go over during fetch as you go. So you can make it easy to start and then make it a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, right? As your dog gets used to it to burn that excess energy. Another thing that I like to do is things like hide and seek with dogs. So I love this game, especially if you have children in your home. It's a great one to get everyone in the family involved with. I love it because it actually increases some great training behaviors that I want a dog to have. Um, so coming when called is a big one here, especially coming when called and they can't see you. Right? But it's also working their nose. It's working their brain of where did mom go? Where did dad go? Right, And really making it a fun way to practice some basic training that we want to build. Um, when you do hide and seek, start easy, really easy, like right around the corner from your dog. Call their name right, and then call them to come. And if they need help, give them some help. Right, 
kissy noises or clapping or moving your feet a little bit to give them a hint of where you are. And then when they find you, have a party, right? You can have a toy that you brought along with you. You can play as part of the reward or you can use a treat or just have a little wrestle ses session with them, whatever they love. So make it exciting when they find you. And then every time you do this, start to hide somewhere a little bit harder, right? And a little bit harder. I don't know if you guys have seen, there's videos on YouTube of people hiding just like behind a door and their dog just runs circles around the house and they can't find them. It's a great way to burn some energy out, get them active where you're just kind of sitting there, right? But make sure your dog always wins in the end, right? Make sure that they have a party when they find you so that the next time you call them to come during hide and seek, they're excited to do it. Right? I think my last house I was in, the only place my dogs couldn't find me at the end was where I was sitting on the clothes washer with the closet doors closed. So everywhere, every other hiding place they could find me. Um, but build up to that, right? You want it to be fun. You want it to be positive and rewarding for them. So they should find you in the end. And you can also do hide and seek with other items. So this is taking some nose work um, and teaching your dog to find something by scent. Um, you can start with treats, right? And hide them in really easy spots to begin with. At first, you can even let them see where you put it and then give them the cue of go find it, whatever you want it to be, and help them find it, right? And then they get the treat when they find it and then make it a little harder and a little harder so that they have to seek it out and work for it, use their nose to find it. You can also do this with more than one thing at a time, right? So it's like a little scavenger hunt around your home really works their brain. And again, burns that excess energy out when we can't go out for those longer walks. Good question, Donna. So is it not confusing to the pups to destroy the TP rolls and then think they can eat and destroy other cardboard boxes? Good question. So this is something in a lot, you're gonna get in the resources, links to Facebook groups for enrichment. There's tons of great groups out there. And this is something that comes up a lot um, how do I make sure my dog doesn't destroy all the boxes or they find another cardboard roll somewhere else and then just think it's their toy? When I do this, I'm pretty clear of I'm giving this to you to enjoy, right? I don't let them just have free access to them in other times. So I make sure I'm the one giving it to them, right? And so where I live, we have a recycling bin and Fozzie could go in and just grab all the cardboard he wants. But because he's just learned through repetition, mom gives me these things. It's more valuable for him there. He's not enticed to go to the other cardboard. It does depend on the dog though. So if you have a dog who shreds and then eats, I would say don't do the paper-based stuff, right? Pick the more durable kind of toys that aren't as shreddable. It does depend on the dog's personality for sure. Um, I'll show you a video here, kind of the whole paper and box thing. Um, cause there, I started with food in this, um, little enrichment, but now I can just put a box out, uh, and I'm going to make sure that the sound is on for this, but now I just put a box out and there's some packing paper in it. And Fozzie's like, this is the best. I love this. Um, and so he just digs around in there. Uh, also Chewy sends like the best packing paper. Um, I don't know if they do it on purpose, but it was awesome. The last chewy box we got. So this is Fozzie. Bring it So he's just snuffling around in there, right? He's not really getting treats all. He's just like, oh, paper. This is really great for tactile experience, right? And getting used to the noise. And he's still a puppy. So socialization is really important. Um, getting him used to the different sounds, the different feels of different, different things, right? So even just taking packing paper, throwing it in a box and letting them snuffle around, right? A lot of my clients have said, ooh, when Amazon deliveries come in, my, my dogs are like, I want to check out the box. I want to check out the box. And if you think about it, that is a lot of olfactory enrichment, right? They're getting to smell all the different things from outside, right? And that new product you got or whatever it might be, it's something different, right? So that's really great enrichment for them. But again, to Donna's question, make sure that your dog isn't one to just inhale things, right? And digest those things that could cause an obstruction. You want to supervise. 
um, and make sure your dog has the right personality for it. Okay. That one. Okay. So I talked about hide and seek. We talked about using nose work, so hiding objects instead of persons hiding. The other things I want to talk about are basic training. So a lot of people don't think of training as enrichment, but it's enrichment and it's a great energy burner, right? So the, the more you work their brain to balance out the lack of physical exercise in the winter, the better off you'll be. They'll be more tired, right? They'll want to nap more. So take the opportunity for really short and sweet training sessions throughout the day. This shouldn't be, oh, I have to put aside an hour to train my dog, right? And who has time for that? So I really recommend two to five minutes at the most for each training session. Mix it in where you can. If, there's, if you're watching TV and relaxing and the commercials come on, use that opportunity to do a couple repetitions of something with your dog, right? And it can be as simple as basic obedience, but it can also be something fun, right? It can be a trick. And for dogs, anything is a trick, right? They don't think of sit as basic obedience. They're just like, oh, I can make my human click or say yes and give me a treat if I do this or if I beg, right? It's just another action for them. So everything's a trick. You wanna make it fun. You wanna keep it short and keep it really sweet and positive, right? So pick a fun trick right now with Fozzie Bear, I'm working on hold. So like take a stick in your mouth and hold it, right? I'm working with him towards the AKC trick title, uh, which anyone can do. You don't have to have a purebred dog to do it. It's actually really fun. Um, and you start off with the novice level. So you have to do 10 tricks from a list but you can lure, you can use food treats and all this stuff at that level. So anyone can do it. Um, I will include a link to check it out if it's something you wanna do with your dog. Um, I'm working on it with Fozzy and some of my colleagues are working on it as well with their dogs. Um, but you can pick some fun tricks to work on. And then during COVID, the judging for the title is actually done virtually. So it's really easy for anyone to get involved with. So that would be a really fun winter activity over the next few months for you to work on with your dogs and puppies. So I highly recommend that program. The other thing I like to work on when the weather's bad and to keep my dogs physically healthy, um, to make sure that they're staying stretched is to practice some at-home balance work. We call this proprioception. So their body awareness, right? A lot of dogs don't realize that they have back feet, especially puppies, right? That's why they're also floppy and, and just awkward. So we wanna teach them some things that help them learn balance, that keep the musculature healthy. So like for my older dog, Sookie, you'll see a video later where I'm working with her on a stool um, to help keep her back end stronger, right? As dogs get older, they lose some of that, that muscle, the muscle mass. And so I wanna make sure that she stays strong in the back end um, and also work her core. This is just a basic, I think it's like a baby stool that I got on Amazon, super cheap. Um, I got one of these for her. And then also you'll see Fozzie on his balance disc, which also I got online for like 15 bucks. I think this is a human one too. They make dog ones specifically. Fit Paws is a great brand, um, but they are expensive. But the difference is that the rubber's thicker because claws and things like that. Um, and then the shapes are different too. If you plan on doing really intense core work for your dog um, or get them used to the conditioning needed for agility, Getting a big peanut ball is a great option. Um, and Fit Paws makes really good ones for different sizes of dogs. But if you're just kind of playing around with it at home and doing it for some basic conditioning, a human balance disc will work just fine. And then you can change how much balance they need based on how much air you put in. So the less air, the more floppy it is, right? So the harder they have to work. But these things really burn physical energy build their muscle, keep their muscle mass if they're getting older and just help build body awareness. So it's a great way to keep them active physically while it's gross outside. So I'll play a video here of both the balance disc and the uh, stool with Suki. Here we go. I think sound should work on this. And this is just having fun. So I'm clicking and treating, but I'm not necessarily training anything in particular. I'm clicking from being on the balance disc and following a lure. And if you notice, I have a carpet there so his back feet don't slip. be 
on the floor. So one thing that balance discs can do is one, they get your dog used to like moving surfaces. If you ever want to paddleboard or go sailing with your dog in the summer, in the winter, work on balance discs and balance boards to help your dog get used to that feeling, right? It's really important, but it's working their core, right? It's really good for core work, teaching him to balance himself if he feels a little unsteady. So they're really working some great muscles there. And then with Suki, I do it with a stool. Because she's older, I really want to focus on her back end strength. So I'm kind of having her shift her weight back and forth um, to build that for her and keep her in shape. And she's going to offer tons of behaviors that she normally gets to do, by the way. So my goal with her is just practice getting up and standing really tall, right? She used to be a show dog when she was very, very young. So I like seeing her actually stack herself, right? It's really good muscle memory and then working her back end because she's 11 now. So I want her to keep that muscle mass in the back. So having her sit and down, that's all great, right? But I want her to learn push with your back end. So using a stool, using balance discs, different peanuts and donuts that they have are great ways to burn physical energy during the winter. Uh, Sleepy Pod's great, by the way, Donna. So love that you ordered that. Yeah, try it out with Macy. You might need a bigger one. There's different styles. So there's that like soft rubber where you fill it with air. There's also ones they make where you could DIY it if you feel up for it, um, where you get a board and then you put a ball in the middle, right? So it looks like Saturn. <laughs> and so it's easier for bigger dogs because uh, you can get them a lot bigger. I'll find a link so you can see what those look like and put it in the resources. So um, they're pretty cool. If you buy them though, they are not cheap. Um, this is the one thing with starting agility stuff. This is technically agility foundation stuff. If you go to buy it online, it can get expensive, but you can also DIY a lot of it or find something similar that's human side. You just need to watch for like their claws and things like that, but I'll find some links for you guys to see. Speaking of agility stuff, um, you can get some fun things for inside the home that also work in yards if you have a yard during the summer. But in our office, uh, we had some fit pause jumps um, that I'll show you here. Super fun to see dogs work through this. You don't have to be getting into agility to do these kinds of things. You can also make your own jumps using things that you have in your home. Um, so like boxes of soda cans, you can use those as obstacles. You just wanna make sure that it's doable for your dog size. But I'll share this one of Clover. This is more of a training session where she's getting clicked for jumping over the three jumps, right? And then I'll show you a more fun way uh, to interact <laughs> with, with the jumps in a second here. I love how she just is like, okay, I'll jump over it again, right? So there's lots of things like this that you can do in your home for agility that's burning physical energy. It doesn't take a lot of space, right? So that was a more training version, uh, but we also did um, a little limbo with our office dogs uh, using those jumps. So if you have a smaller dog, you can teach them to go under poles as well. Um, and I love this video, which is why I wanted to play it. So it doesn't have to be perfect agility, right? Just getting your dog moving and having fun with things that you might have, just getting some cones um, through Amazon, they're like kids cones, right? 
you can set these up. And with Suki, I was doing some figure eights, right? And then having her go under the pole, right? So just making it fun doesn't have to be complicated. You can just take a food treat, lure them around, right? Make them work for it a little bit and have fun with it. Um, so look around your home over the next couple of weeks and be like, what can I do with this to keep the dog active and make them work, right? So I love those things, working in some agility. I did get a question in one of our emails um, before Yappy Hour asking about treadmills um, for dogs, which can be really, really good um, depending on your dog and their needs, right? So for some working breeds, you need a lot of exercise to burn that energy, right? They need a job. And so if during the winter, we aren't able to burn it with runs or lots of outside play, we have to figure out how do I balance this for physically, right? The mental enrichment is not going to be enough for some of these dogs. So treadmills can be a good option. I do always wanna make sure that anyone trying a treadmill with their dog takes the time to train them for it. Um, so it's not something you can just throw your dog on, hit go and let them run. One, you wanna make sure your dog is physically mature enough for the repetitive nature of that kind of exercise. So if you have a dog who's still maturing or their growth plates aren't totally closed, uh, you don't wanna do really long walks or walks on the treadmill, right? Or running lots of pressure on the ends of those bones. So you wanna make sure your dog is physically ready. Your veterinarian is going to be your best resource to tell you, yeah, now is okay time for your dog to start doing these things or maybe wait a little bit longer. Smaller dogs physically mature faster than bigger dogs, right? So that, that can determine a lot about growth plates for your dog. And then you wanna make sure you introduce the treadmill in a very positive way um, and teach them how to get on and off, start very slow. You wanna make sure that you're staying safe with it. Um, I actually, I always get scared when I see a dog tethered to the ted treadmill because if they slipped off, they're still stuck. Right. And so that can be really scary. So you want to make sure you have a setup that's safe. You want to make sure they're supervised at all times. And you want to make sure you're keeping it at a good pace for them. Right. You're not doing tons of treadmill at once. You're staying at a good pace for them so they don't get exhausted. Right. And then you're managing the speed. Right. As they as they kind of get more tired, you want to stop the treadmill or you want to keep it at a lower um, lower speed for them. So if you decide to do a treadmill during winter time for your dog, awesome. Just do the prep work right? Get your dog used to it. Make sure it's safe. Make sure they're ready for it as you go. So I would do. I'm trying to think my other enrichment ideas. I have so many like training things around me that I'm like, what did I forget? And my dogs keep moving them. Any questions right now about winter fun ideas um, or other activities? Oh, I was going to talk about sniffaris. So obviously we, stu we still need to go outside <laughs> during the winter with our dogs, but especially like where it's icy and you can't go on walks, even short walks can be really dangerous depending on where you are. If it's icy, instead opt for sniffaris, right? So get a longer lead for your dog and maybe go to somewhere that's a little bit more open, like a good park and let your dog sniff and wander a little bit instead of a more regimented walk with them. Even if you kind of stay in one area at the end of that long lead and let them kind of work their way around you in a big circle, that's really burning a lot of energy. They're, they're taking in so much information through their nose and they're getting to see the sights, right? And hear all the noises, all of those senses are working. And so it's burning a lot of energy without having to walk, right? Um, so that's a good option for winter walks instead of having to walk down icy sidewalks um, it's, it's actually really fun for dogs who've never like seen snow before <laughs> to like see them do a sniffari in the snow because everything smells different in the snow and it feels different in the snow. So it's a really cool enrichment for them um, as you go. And then safety wise, if you do go on walks um, and it's dark out, there's lots of great things out there. There's some like LED light up collars, there's light up leashes. Make sure you're visible, not just your dog. Um, is visible because you need to stay safe too. Um, so getting some safety things for you to wear when it's dark out, super important. I'll make sure to include like walking your dog at night resource that we have um, with some of our recommended things that you can do to stay safe in the winter. Okay. Let me know if there's any other questions about that, but otherwise Mia, I think, I think I played all the videos I wanna play.
I did. <laughs> I'm sure there's some kind of other fun video that you'd like to play, yeah. but. There's so many on my computer right now, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we roll into the audience questions? I think so. Yeah, so we have a bunch that were sent in ahead of time, but if you're here live, pop them in the chat and we will work them in as we go. Oh, this is a good question in chat. <laughs> Can dogs get frostbite when walking through the snow? Yes, so cold weather walks. You wanna make sure if you have a dog who is not built for cold weather, like a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, that they are outfitted correctly, right? Little fleece pullovers, sweaters are great, especially for the breeds like Danes and Chihuahuas that don't have that double coat, right? Also Chihuahuas are really low to the ground. So they'll get colder faster because they're right there in the snow. So you want to make sure they're insulated. You want to make sure you're not out there for a really long time, right? So not taking an hour walk. Instead, maybe it's five to 10 minutes just to go potty. And then we go inside and we play, right? Something that's more inside, outside's more just for potty with those dogs. But they make great booties um, for winter. There's also something called Musher's Secret. I wish I'd brought it upstairs. It's downstairs. It's like a little paw wax um, that you can put on your dog's paw pads. One, it helps prevent ice and things from just getting up into their paw pads and sticking on their fur. I don't know if you've ever seen that on dog paws. It helps prevent that. It also helps with any um, de-icer or salt on the sidewalks. You want to try to avoid that on your dog's paws so they don't lick it. Um, but things like that can help it just kind of get off afterwards. Make sure you're wiping their paws after walks too, just to make sure all the, the winter stuff is off. But yeah, you want to make sure that they're properly insulated. Obviously, if you have an Alaskan Malamute, a little less of something you have to worry about, right? They were bred for that environment. And so many Husky and Malamute owners that I know are like, my dog doesn't want to come inside. They want to stay out in the snow. And I'm like, yes, they love it. Right. But you do want to make sure you're watching them for any symptoms of frostbite, right? Where you can see tenderness, redness on their paws, their nose, right? You really want to make sure you're checking them over after being outside in the cold, managing their time outside, right? Some, just some basic cold weather safety for your dog, just like you would for you. Right. So Great question. Very good question. All right. Um, so Dennis wrote in and asked, how do you keep an active puppy quiet in a cage for six weeks after elbow operations on both front legs? Oy. Both legs were pinned with screws. Uh, I'm finding it almost impossible, I'm sure. Um, the dog is a cockapoo, and prior to the operation, she was very active and not curtailed at all. She's extremely intelligent and probably cannot understand why she's being caged. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's just a tough situation, right? Because to heal, they can't move around a lot. So I like to think about what can I do with a dog in a smaller confined area that's working all of their senses, right? To burn the excess energy. So things like dog TV, I don't know if anyone's heard of that yet or checked it out, um, can be a great enrichment for dogs who are confined in kennels because it's different sites, including the sounds. So you can turn on the TV <laughs> to like watch different things. I think they even have like virtual walks for your dog that they do. So that's one thing for sight that you could add in to keep them a little bit more entertained, work their brain a little bit. You could even maybe place the crate somewhere where they can see out a window. I would only do this if they're not going to become amped up when they see a dog walk by, right? It depends on the dog for this. Um, you don't want them to get overexcited when they're in their crate and alert bark and learn that habit. Um, but changing up the sights that they see um, can help with confined crate confined dogs. Um, thinking about touch as a sense. So obviously getting to chew on different kinds of things in their crate, it's great tactile experience, also taste built into this. Um, but so you can do lots of interactive toy feeding um, or edible chews like bully sticks. One thing I really recommend though is if you're not closely supervising bully sticks or other chews is making sure that they're safe for your dog to have. So this is like a hack that we figured out at the office. This is a quizzle from West Paw um, and it fits a bully, most bully sticks. Some of them are too thick but you can stick the bully stick in there and then you can't get it out very easily. I have to use pliers actually to get it out. Um, but when the dog chews it too small, they can't swallow it, right? And so it's one way to keep it safe. 
There are things made specifically as bully stick holders. I have yet to find one that I like, honestly. So this we just kind of figured out by playing around with it and putting a bully stick in there and it worked. So my dog also loves it because she can hold it and like angle it around. It's pretty funny to watch. Um, so finding some way to provide them with some kind of tactile experience in their crate is another way to satisfy the senses. But another touch is also like massage and petting from you. Um, that can be a great enrichment experience um, and a way to work a sense, right? So nice slow massages that you can do or petting. Um, you don't wanna get her amped up, right? So the slower, the better. Right, not oh, let's get excited, right? It's gonna make any any puppy excited. Um, so really nice and slow. There's lots of cool things um, out there about dog massage. Um, so you can learn like different techniques and things in different spots and what to do. I'll try to find one for resources um, and see if I can include it in there, make a note of that. So those are some ideas. Other things you can do to work the brain, short and sweet training sessions. Think about Okay, you can't stand up and move around really in your crate for training, but there's lots of things you can train that don't involve that. Um, something as simple as like chin rests, right? Teaching your, your dog to put their chin on something or touch their nose to something. Um, really low movement training that you can still have that interaction and still work her brain um, would be a good way uh, to work, work her brain, burn the energy out. Other things like licking, licking is a chewing, is a calming activity, just like chewing is. Um, so maybe having a licky mat like this one. Um, yep, he, Fozzie just finished this and so it's pretty clean now. <laughs> um, but using this as a way where it's not high calorie, you don't have to put a lot of smeared wet food or peanut butter um, or Greek yogurt on there. It can be very thin. And then some, some of my clients, I've seen shelters do this too. They'll punch some holes in this and then hang it on the side of the crate or the kennel um, so that the dog can't then just run off with it. Um, so licking would be another good option um, besides the chews and that touch. And then sound, if you do dog TV or like find something on YouTube, it should include sound with the sites, but you can also, you know, turn on the radio, change the, the station a lot. It's just different audio um, input for their brain to work through. So it's tough though. It's very tough with crate, crate rest. Yeah, I wouldn't like crate rest for myself either. <laughs> um, and speaking of dog TV, I'm not sure if that it is actually dog TV or something similar, but there's this um, kind of random free TV app um, called Pluto TV. And they have like a dog channel and a cat yeah. channel. And it's free and it, it has like a bunch of random stuff. So I would highly recommend it even for human uh, for human a relaxing you know, thing, just to put it on in the background. I well, they do actually have one uh, channel that's dedicated to like long train rides in Oslo. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so yeah, there's a bit of something oh, for everybody. In that too, right? <laughs> yeah, mix it up. Mix it up. <laughs> um, so Roberta uh, wrote in with two questions. Um, she says. I have a five month old border collie healer mix, a little coon hound in there too. She's very smart and has taken quickly to the few commands our trainer has given her. I'm planning on getting her into agility training and wonder about the best age to begin. I'm also debating the best time to get her spayed. I'm getting such mixed advice from vets in my veterinary practice and my trainer, a retired military dog trainer. So thought I'd ask for your advice just to add to the mix. Add me to the mix. Add <laughs> me to all the, the advice that you're getting. I love it. So the first question about agility. You can start agility prep really, really young. The thing is, is you don't want to jump You I'm in most reputable agility classes will not let you start too young with dogs going up obstacles and, and overdoing it on their joints. There's a lot of foundation training to agility, especially if you want to compete in agility, if you're not just doing fun agility, right? You want to make sure you're staying safe and not actually injuring your puppy. Um, so the foundations classes are great because you need some basic training to have that control on a course. So actually Fozzie Bear, my puppy, we're in a puppy agility course right now. Um, at our dog training facility that we attend. Um, and it's not really jumping over things, right? Or going up the A-frame or doing the balance. It's building the foundation for that. So building things with the balance disc and the stool to build that awareness 
back end awareness, right? Starting those foundations, teaching them how to turn one way, how to follow a hand, right? So that you teach them to follow directions when, you, when you're going to be running around a course with them. So starting all of that as young as you can is great, right? If you can find a puppy foundations agility course near you, sign up, right? It's going to be the best option. There's also lots of things online though that you can start doing um, with young puppies to start getting ready for full agility. Um, the Fenzy Dog Sports Academy is all virtual and they are awesome. They have so many different programs for different dog sports. Um, so really anyone, it's not just agility. There's nose work in there, there's tray ball, um, there's man trailing, <laughs> there's like all these different dog sports now, dock diving. But you can get started virtually, right? And then get your dog ready or your puppy ready and then find a club near you um, that you can start getting ready. But you really wanna make sure your dog's physically mature before starting to do those higher obstacles and jumping and landing, right? Um, but yeah, I, I would say get started as soon as you can. It's super fun. Um, second question about spaying. This is commonly asked question. Um, and I think the best answer is, I pulled it up actually, it's from the American Veterinary Medical Association. Um, and they say, for canine patients, due to the varied incidence and severity of disease processes, there is no single recommendation that would be appropriate for all dogs. So developing recommendations for an informed case-by-case -case assessment requires an evaluation of the risks and benefits, right? Including its potential effects on neoplasia, which is like cancer, right? Orthopedic disease, reproductive disease, behavior, right? Longevity, and then population management. So there's all these things that go into, why are we spaying and neutering these dogs? They also say, however, many factors other than neuter status play an important role in these outcomes. So including the breed, sex, genetics, lifestyle, and body condition. So there's all these things that can inform the decision, which is why when people ask me, well, when should I spay my dog or when should I neuter my dog? I go, that is a discussion you need to have with your vet. I'm happy to be a part of it, but I can't give you the health side of it, right? I'm just a trainer. So I got to stay in my lane, but your vet can give you an idea of for your dog's breed, right? And for any possible disease risks that might come along with spay and neuter or without spay and neuter, these are what they are. And then you can think about what's my lifestyle, right? What are my goals with this dog? How am I going to manage their environment and be a responsible dog owner if I choose not to spay or neuter them, right? Why am I waiting for a certain amount of time? In some cases, people sign agreements with their breeders that they will not spay and neuter until a certain time, right? Other breeders require it right away. It just depends. So there's lots of things that, that really determine uh, when you should spay or neuter, but it's definitely a, a personal decision. Um, and I think it's one that, that you need to, you know, weigh the pros and cons for yourself and your lifestyle, and then talk to your vet about possible health issues and reasons. Um, I was just talking to my vet the other day about when, well, when are you going to neuter Fozzie? And she told me her recommendations. And I said, well, this is what my breeder wanted. This is what I'm thinking for behavior, right? And things like that. And so, you know, right now we're kind of waiting to see, right? My breeder said, you know, I prefer you to wait to as close as two years old as you can. And I was like, how am I going to make it two years with a male dog who's unneutered, <laughs> right? Because there's some behavior things that come along with that. Right, they get a little humpy sometimes. Um, you know, they start to mark a little bit more. So I'm weighing the pros and cons, right? But medically, talking to my vet, I was like, you know, I want to wait till at least nine months. If I and if I can push it longer than that, I'd like that. But it depends on what his behavior is like, what my lifestyle is like, what I can handle. Um, so, so yeah, uh, it really depends. It's a great question, <laughs> and I I don't know if I gave a definite answer other than that weigh all the, the pros and cons for yourself and what you can manage. The one thing I would say is if you cannot properly contain your unneutered male dog, um, get them neutered. Um, if you cannot keep your unspayed female dog inside and protected while in heat, get her spayed, right? Because the last thing you want to do is contribute to breeding unplanned litters, right? Um, that's how we get tons of dogs in shelters, 
right? And backyard litters that, you know, not what breeders want. Reputable breeders will, will be happy to let you spay or neuter your dog if you cannot manage that situation. So, fun stuff. I think you did it. I think you answered it. <laughs> <Long answer. laughs> um, so Joanne wrote in and asked, my six month old Labradoodle gets excited when meeting people and likes to jump on them. I've used the off command and it works for like five seconds, then he's at it again. I also try to use the leash to contain him and ask him to sit. Any suggestions? Yeah, so what's nice is you already have the foundation for off, right? You already have the beginning. Now it's just like they jump after five seconds again, right? Which five seconds, not bad for how old? Five months or six months old? Not bad for an excitable six month old, but the goal is to increase the duration, keep them from jumping up again. Um, we have an awesome uh, yappy hour we did about jumping, which will have even more uh, tips. Um, so that's on our, that's on our YouTube channel um, that you can check out. But what I would do is keep your dog on leash when greeting people. And if you can set up the whole context a little bit more controlled. So don't give your dog enough leash to jump. Um, make sure that you're asking for a sit before they jump, right? So you're trying to preemptively train this and proactively train it. Um, so if you can give the person that they want to greet some treats, <laughs> even better, and they are rewarding the sit. Um, or in some cases, I've done this where I have a really bad jumper and I will step on the leash so that there's slack in the leash so they can stand or sit comfortably. There's no tension there but it's just enough length so that if they try to jump, there's nowhere to go, right? And so that can really be nice for people who aren't very strong and they have a big dog, right? That can help prevent the jumping from inadvertently being reinforced, right? So that's just an environmental control there where we're trying to prevent the jumping. Another thing I would suggest is make sure you're rewarding the off. And I would actually change it to where I say off, good job, they get off and I put the treat on the ground. And before they jump up again, so almost right as they're finishing that treat, I will drop another treat on the ground, right? And another treat on the ground. So they're learning some duration and that, oh, all the, the treats happen down here. So they start to get into this habit of, I get to meet someone, I go, I run up to them and a treat's on the ground. So you start to see a dog who looks to the ground and they're not jumping, right? And so really controlling the environment and rewarding them where you want them to be um, and then you start basically increasing the amount of time between reinforcement. And you can also add in some real life reinforcement. So non-food reinforcement to be able to fade out treats in the long run. Make sure you're using that attention from the person they're greeting as the reward, right? So making sure that as long as their feet are on the ground or they're in a sit, that's when you can pay attention to them. If they start jumping again, there does need to be a consequence. So either that person needs to turn and walk away, bye you lose the thing you want, right? If you jump or she can turn and walk away with the dog, right? It's called negative punishment. We're taking away something the dog wants to make the behavior decrease. But no punishment is effective unless you also teach them what to do instead. So making sure to reinforce the off position, whether that's a sit or just four paws on the floor, the tension and food or toys if they're toy motivated. So, but yeah, I would, I would say, manage the environment and then check out our, was it the last app hour? I can't even remember what the last one was um, that we have about jumping. There's some video examples in there as well. I think it was from a few yappy hours ago, but um, I linked to our YouTube channel in the chat in case anybody um, wants, but I'm sure that you, you'll include it, uh, a link also in the follow-up. I will. Yeah. I will. <laughs> um, Alicia asks, how do I keep my puppy from getting overly excited when I get home? It can turn into an hour of overly excited behavior. Yeah, really good question. So we want our dogs to be happy to see us <laughs> when we go home, but if it turns into this overstimulated like psycho dog, that can be really annoying um, and not good on the stress levels of the dog that, that might actually speak to some anxiety um, maybe they are developing separation anxiety. And so when you come home, it's that excessive greeting that, that lasts a really long time or it's just over the top. Um, so first thing I would do is I would make sure there's not separation anxiety going on. Um, 
However, if it's a puppy, I think she mentioned it's puppy. It's hard to diagnose separation anxiety in dogs under one year old because there's so many other things that those symptoms could be indicative of. So, um, but that's one thing I'd want to have her look at with her puppy. Um, the next thing I would do is, and this is something I did, I had my last dog in Sookie. They would do this where they get really, really excited when I walk in the door and they're corgis and they're underfoot. And it's like, I'm going to die because <laughs> these dogs are going to trip me, right? And I might have groceries or whatever. So what I started doing is I started changing the routine when I get home where I totally ignored them and went about my business, right? Putting my groceries down, putting my purse up, taking my coat off, taking my shoes off, totally ignoring the dogs, waiting for the moment that they kind of took a breath and weren't as excited. And I had one more piece of criteria there where it's you, right? So you had to be on the carpeted part of my home at the time. So there was the entryway that was wood floors and then the carpet. So I basically ignored them until they were there and until they kind of taken a breath. And then I was like, good job. Hello. Nice to see you. And then we got some love, right? So I was using the thing they wanted, which was my attention to reinforce the behavior I wanted, which was calming down and being out of the entryway, right? And it took some repetition, right? But when they realize like we're running around like crazies and nothing's happening, she's not giving us any attention, they started to get to the living room faster, right? They started to be like, you're home, you're home. And they'd run to their little spot on the carpet, like right at the edge of the entryway. And they'd sit there and be like, hi. And then I'd finish taking off my shoes and then, okay, hi, right? So I made sure to reinforce what I wanted, which was calmer behavior with the attention, right? You can use treats in this moment as well, but I would actually recommend using a longer lasting calming uh, food reward. So things like um, licking, chewing, and sniffing are all very calming for hyper anxious dogs. So having something ready to give them that they have to lick at and work at, it's a little longer duration um, or a licky mat ready. So you get home, you take off your shoes, you go grab a licky mat from the freezer, put it in their crate or their pen, wherever, let them lick at it, right? So it's something that's keeping them focused on one thing, relieving any anxiety they might have, helping their brain kind of calm down a little bit, preventing them from bouncing off the walls and, and running around and being crazy. So finding something that's rewarding and calming for them to do um, and or teaching them what to do instead. Right. The other thing that comes to mind there is making sure that they're getting enough physical exercise, mental enrichment at other times to help burn any excess energy out. So, um, let's uh, take a break and go to not not a real break. We'll go to look at a question that came into the chat um, from uh, Raisa. I, I hope I am saying your name correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, and they ask any way to train a healer not to nip at my 11 year old's heels. Yes. Yes. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to start off with that. <laughs> there is a way, um, but healers were bred to do this. So what we have to do, we're fighting against a lot of breed instincts. Um, and I have corgis, so herding breeds like to nip. <laughs> you want to make sure you're giving them an appropriate outlet for their herding behavior. Um, and starting to, you can even put it on cue for some dogs. So it's like when you're working at this game, that's when you can do this behavior, right? And so you're giving them an outlet for their instincts. Things like jolly balls or jolly eggs are really cool um, toys for herding breeds because they just like knock it around the yard. I don't recommend doing it if you live in a home with hard floors. They're really loud. Um, and honestly, if they threw it hard enough, they could probably put a hole in the wall. Um, but something that burns the herding energy and the nipping energy, things like flirt poles can also be good for herding breeds um, to do, to get that energy out. The other thing I would do is really manage the environment so the healer doesn't have the opportunity to practice nipping at humans' heels, um, because all that's doing is reinforcing itself. It probably feels amazing for that healer to be doing what they were bred to do. So not allowing the dog to be in the area when the 11 year old is walking or running around. Sometimes it depends on the dog. Sometimes they have to be running, right? The, and kids can get amped up and they're loud and they're fun and they're jerky compared to adults, right? So some dogs, they only get stimulated for that and, and start to nip when the kids are running 
and being really loud. Others, it's kind of like, oh, you're moving. So I'm going to go for your heels. So depending on the severity of it, you have to manage the environment. So either keeping them inside while the kids are playing outside, having them on leash, and then rewarding for not chasing after and staying calm with you, right? So 11 year old walks by, you didn't go for the heels. Yes, good job. Or 11 year old walks by, sit down. Yes, here's a treat, right? So reinforcing incompatible behaviors um, is gonna go a long way paired with managing the environment, right? Um, giving the 11 year old some tools to redirect if needed um, if, if the dog is getting a little amped up and starting to nip, redirecting them to an appropriate toy or something else to herd um, can also help. But if you're seeing them get amped up around the 11 year old, preemptively move them away, give them something else to do um, that's going to prevent that behavior. That's where I'd start. We also have a nipping workshop where I talk a lot with herding breed owners about what to do um, and how to direct that, that drive into appropriate things. <laughs> Because it can, we have to tweak some things for certain dogs. I see a dog. Hi. Oh my goodness. Oh, she's so cute. The healer in question. <laughs> <laughs> see, I told you, I see a dog. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain though. Corgis are like feet, right? So, oh, you're so cute. Okay. <laughs> so calm. <laughs> um, so Pete wrote in and asked, uh, our 16 week old Goldie uh, whines and barks whenever we both leave the room. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions on how we can address this? Yes, great question. Especially so many people have gotten puppies or dogs during the pandemic, right? Cause a lot of us have more time. Uh, but the flip side of what we're seeing is a lot of dogs aren't getting alone time practice um, and so we're actually seeing a little bit of over-dependence um, and clinginess. And so practicing alone time is really important, um, especially with our pandemic puppies, all dogs. But um, if they've never been left alone before, and if we then all go back to work or go back to school, it is going to be an insane amount of separation anxiety because they won't know how to cope with that. It'll be a brand new experience. And if they're on the more sensitive side, they can flip into separation anxiety. Um, and we don't want any dog to be stressed. So what I would do, um, I feel like Pete is 16 weeks old. Yeah, still really young. So that's awesome. Um, practicing really short alone time. So the first thing I do is I, um, I practice duration. I'm sorry, distance, because duration is added later. You want to start teaching your puppy, okay, you're in your pen or you're in your crate. I'm gonna give you something awesome and yummy in your crate and I'm going to walk away two steps and then immediately come back, the topple goes away and you come out of your crate, right? So you're, you're starting really easy with this where you're building them up slice by slice of the experience of you leaving and being alone, right? So using some of the longer rewards, the food rewards here. So using meal time is a great way to practice alone time. But I don't just give a brand new puppy their meal and leave, right? I start just getting them used to me one step away, two steps away, right? Three steps away. I did this with Bozzy Bear in his crate where he would just working on his topple or his Kong and I'd walk to the top of the stairs and then come back, right? And then the good thing went away when I came back and you came out of the crate for a couple of minutes and then we did it again. Eventually I built it up to where I could walk all the way down the stairs, close the door. And then I think I even got down to the kitchen to grab a LaCroix. If you know me, that's like all I drink. <laughs> so, um, but I built it up in slices, right? And then as I built that up, it was longer and longer duration for the dog. Cause you do want to eventually get them used to, okay, you finished your topple and you're still in your crate. The world didn't end, right? Now you can take a nap or chew on your other crate toy, whatever it might be but you're building the association of me leaving predicts this awesome, yummy thing. And then me coming back makes it go away. <laughs> so you're creating this association of alone times. Okay. Right. Helping them learn how to cope with that. But you do want to start really small as you go. Uh, another thing they might consider is doing um, a plug plugin. Uh, it's a, a calming dog pheromone. It's a synthetic pheromone but it's a synthetic of the natural pheromone that lactating mother dogs emit. So young puppies especially are pretty responsive to it um, where it helps them feel calm and secure. 
other things like to make that pen and crate area a little bit more calming, um, like some white noise. So like turning on a fan or a sound machine or the radio to kind of noise mask a little bit. Um, but if they're really seeing it when I turn to walk away and leave the room, my dog starts to freak out. Then I go, okay, well, let's just build it up slice by slice, get them used to that, teach them a different association for it. It takes some time, but luckily 16 weeks old is a great time to start. Um, takes longer for dogs who are older who've learned to be worried in the first place. Good question. I will add in a video for alone time as well in the resources. It's going to be a lot of resources. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when there's an AMA. <laughs> um, so uh, ah, Cello is back. Uh, Cello the pup. Um, and his owner, um, Kigo or Mabel's here too. She wanted to say hello. Hi, Mabel. Uh, <laughs> so, um, they say our 10 month old puppy who is a medium sized breed male started to growl at us when we just looked at him eating his Kong. Um, we would hand him the Kong. He'd bring it to his personal eating corner. Um, and after a while we would check on him to see if he was done yet or if he wasn't uh, choking when he started making weird noises and he would growl at us. Um, he started this behavior only a while ago and he'll bite if we look closer. Um, he continues, uh, he never did this when we first got him but suddenly it seems like he's more sensitive to it. We've never actually um, taken his food or snacks away from him but we have no idea how we should respond to this. We don't feel comfortable with Cello getting used to us walking away when he warns us to go. Can you read that last part, last sentence again? Sure. Um, they don't feel comfortable with Cello getting used. Basically, they don't want Cello to feel like he's the boss of them, I think. Like mm -hmm. they, they don't want him to feel co uh, comfortable or getting used to them just retreating basically when he warns them to go. Right. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is if your dog growls, stop what you're doing and back up if you need to. The last thing you want to do is teach a dog that you're going to ignore their growl because what comes after a growl? A bite. So if they learn that growling does not work, they will escalate behavior. And the last thing we want is a dog to feel forced into the bite, right? So we, uh, we did a resource guarding yappy hour. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm like, which yappy hours do we do? <laughs> we did one on resource guarding. So I'll make sure to include the link to that and then the, the corresponding article about this because there's gonna be like some video examples um, that you'll be able to see in there. But one thing that I'm thinking is when you say look at him means you're going over to check to make sure he's not choking, right? Because dogs make weird noises, um, which would mean approaching. Right. And so he's, he's basically saying you're now too close and I'm worried that you're going to take my resource away. Um, so that's what we have to figure out for resource guarding cases is what is the threshold? At what point is that dog worried and giving you signs that they're uncomfortable with your approach? And hundred percent of the time, there is always something before the growl that tells, tells me, that dog is going to guard that resource. And it's usually something like freezing. So they're, they're working on it, <laughs> they're working on it, and then they freeze, right? That is a very early sign that they're getting worried about someone coming to take their resource. Um, it can even be they're working on it and they're looking at you like this and there's some whale eye so you can see the side of the whites of their eye, right? They're very aware you're there. They might start eating faster. Right. So there's lots of little things before the growl that I'd want to try to identify to really get the true threshold for a dog so that, again, we're not escalating their response to more aggressive responses. Right. Because if we were other dogs, we would see a freeze and we'd be like, oh, sorry. Right. And we'd either go away or we'd be like, I'm willing to fight for that. <laughs> right. Humans should not be willing to fight for these things, right? We have better tools. We have bigger brains that we can use to change this behavior. So I want to find the threshold. And then at that distance at which I am where the dog is, is starting to be like, are you coming to take my thing? That's where I start to teach them a different emotional response to my approach. So it is a, here's your Kong, go enjoy it in your safe space. I will walk to say eight steps away from you where you notice that I'm coming, but you're not growling yet. You're not getting really tense yet. You notice me, chicken falls and I walk away. 
I walk back to eight steps away, chicken falls and I walk away, right? And so with repetition, the dog goes, oh, you're coming over here. Oh, there's chicken, <laughs> right? So their emotional response to your approach changes from one of worry about losing that resource to one of, oh, this is awesome. I want you to come this way. And as I do this, I what, what happens is the distance gets smaller and smaller because the dog then is like, oh yes, come closer, more chicken. Right. And you start to see in the in the article I'll include, there's a great video from a shelter working with resource guarding where the dog actually like lifts their head out of the food bowl and sits and it's like, hi, thanks for coming. Right. So they they choose to leave their resource that previously they were guarding because they've learned a different association. And that's the association we want. As you work through that behavior modification process, which is always easier with the help of a trained professional to help guide you and work individually with you. Um, you want to make sure your dog has a safe space to enjoy their stuff on their own in peace, right? Let them eat in peace. Let them eat their chew in peace. It, obviously keep an ear out if they're going to choke on it. Uh, if it's a Kong, it should be big enough that they shouldn't be able to swallow it. So you can maybe change up what kind of interactive toy or something you're giving them uh, to make sure it's not a choking hazard, but let them finish it in peace. Right? Don't set them up for failure there. Don't set them up to escalate their behavior. Um, other things I work on outside of that context are things like drop it, um, right? Using maybe toys, lower value things before I start working with higher value things. Um, if you have to get something away from a dog who's resource guarding that they find very high value, find something else that's very high value. And a lot of times call them over and they'll be like, oh, you have that, I want that. And they'll run over and get it. And then you can give that to them go grab the thing they're not supposed to have, right? But working on things like drop it and leave it, coming when called, right? Things, some of the basics to help management while you work through that behavior plan. Um, but I will make sure to include the resource guarding resources, resource guarding resources <laughs> um, for you. Cause yeah, whole yappy hour on it. And then the article has some great videos. So, it's a and tough he, behavior. It's He just added, what? how about when he's sleeping um, just, now uh we went over to the couch where he was sleeping and when we reached over to pet him he growled and snapped at us mm -hmm. so similar thing one a lot of times sleeping dogs if they're asleep and then we touch them they startle so if i already have a dog who guards things or is a little cautious or wary i'm not super surprised if they startle and bite when they're sleeping also i always recommend and any of my behavior clients, no matter what the thing, I always recommend a med check first. So going to your veterinarian and checking for pain, also checking hearing um, and sight, things like that, that could be contributing to, I didn't hear you coming, so you startled me, or I can't see you, right? Kind of making sure that everything is, is good to go from the vet side before we um, address the behavior. So if he does that, call his name first to let him know that you're on the way. Right. And then we would work through the same kind of thing of working up to, I can approach and touch you, or are you guarding the space in this situation? Then we're going to work on that resource guarding. But in the meantime, I'm going to make sure you see me coming and I'm going to tell you to get off, right. And reward you for getting off. So that way you realize, oh, it's way more rewarding to be down here. I don't, I don't get to guard this space. It's not mine. So working it that way, but yeah, it, each resource, sometimes it's the same idea, but kind of different in practice things that we do um, for the program. All right, um, Delia says, we have a four month old shepherd mix puppy. We have restricted her to our kitchen and have been taking her to our backyard at least every half hour after meals, after naps, etc. We give her treats when she pees or poops outside. Um, I can't believe I have a job where I talk about peeing and pooping all the time. Okay, our challenge is that she barks frequently and jumps on the child gate separating her from us. Mm -hmm. We suspect that she either one, wants to go out in order to get the treat or two, wants to be with us in the adjacent family room. And she occasionally pees in the kitchen when we're not around. What are we doing wrong? What can we do differently? <laughs> That's um, not a big question. <laughs> You're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> like Raising a puppy is hard um, and it can be frustrating and they can be little monsters and then they're cute and they make up for it. Um, so awesome that you're on a really good schedule for potty training. 
Um, I'll talk about the occasional pee in the kitchen. Start to track when those are happening. We have a potty log, which makes this easy. I'll write that down on the resources list. Um, where start to track when these accidents are happening. That gives you an idea if it's part of the schedule that you need to tweak. So, okay, she has accidents at 1 p.m. ish every day. I'm going to take her out before then, right? It's closer to that time to preempt that accident. Also, you can look at like what activities are going on around that time that maybe trigger it. Figuring out the potty schedule really helps prevent accidents if we're proactively giving those outside trips. So even just tweaking the, the frequency um, or the time in between those breaks might help with those occasional accidents. Now, there are gonna be accidents when house training a puppy, it just happens. Um, I always joke that my puppy only had accidents when my boyfriend was watching him, but that's not true. There was like one time that I was like, oh, I totally ignored you, sorry. Um, so you might consider though, reducing the space um, when she's alone. So this is where crate training or using a playpen can help with potty training. Cause if they have enough space to go to the bathroom in one area and then play and sleep and eat in the other, they're going to be more comfortable with that versus if it's a smaller area, that's where they sleep. That's where they eat. And so they have an instinctual drive to not soil there. So sometimes we just give them too much access too soon. Um, so even if you just kind of take that space down a little bit um, and kind of reset, and then as you go more and more time without an accident, you start expanding it, right? And giving them more freedom um, as you go. So that's, that's one thing I do. Um, the other question was, she barks frequently and jumps on the gate separating her from you. Yeah, I probably would too, if I was a puppy and I'm like, you're over there and I'm in here and why? Right? <laughs> so couple options you can do. Um, if you're comfortable with it, depending on where in the home you're at, um, you can bring her to where you are and have some interaction. Um, I would say have her on leash tether or very closely supervised, right? You don't, again, want her wandering and being like, I'm going to pee over here because it's new. Um, so you do want to keep her closely supervised. But if it isn't a no dog zone in your house, making sure she has something positive to do on her side which is building that, it's fun on my side. My side is awesome. So stuffed Kong, stuffed topples, um, edible chews in a safe holder, things like that to keep her busy. But then think about also, how can I increase your interaction and engagement with me to tire you out before I leave you in your area alone, right? So sometimes increasing mental enrichment really helps. Um, doing a little bit more training sessions throughout the day, trying to get her to the point where she's like, I'm ready to take a nap now, you go do your thing. That's when she's in the kitchen alone um, or doing some flirt pole play in there before you go to relax in the other room. Um, just trying to figure out a way to, to make her more tired, less worried that you're in the other room, um, giving her something positive to do, to build the association that being alone is fine. And this might mean kind of going back to, was it um, Pete's question where, us leaving makes the dog whine and bark. Maybe you have to do some of that leaving practice to desensitize the puppy to that experience, right? Puppies are learning a lot in those first few weeks. So, and being left alone is a hard because most of them had big litters and they're like never alone. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's where I would start with that. Um, that one. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh... I guess take a couple more. I know everybody or some of us need to have dinner. Some of us probably already yeah, had dinner. Yeah, like I am, I could talk for hours. <laughs> so feel free if you have to go. Thank you for coming. Um, I will send out the resources obviously after this, uh, probably in the morning so that the video renders for everyone. But yeah, don't feel bad jumping out. Um, Marlene has two questions. Uh, one, we live in an apartment building high rise and don't want to go outside frequently every day. We take the puppy for a long walk once a day. We have a five month old puppy that we're trying to house break using pee pads. He goes on the pee pee pads when he's in the same room as the pads. However, uh, marks or goes on the floor if he's in another room. Um, I take him to the pads every few hours, but sometimes he doesn't go. At which point, uh, at which point I let him go into another room with me, which is when he will make on the floor. 
what shall we do? Um, so that's question number one, and then I will pause and then <laughs> wait for question two. <laughs> question two. Um, okay, five month old. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you live in a high rise apartment, it can be tough to get outside. So potty pads were made for this situation. Um, what I would suggest doing with a five month old is actually going back to the beginning in house training because he hasn't made the association of where his potty spot is inside. Um, so going back to very frequent potty breaks to the potty spot. And if he goes, reward, right? Praise, petting, treat, if you have it, right? Back to that beginning. Um, if he doesn't go, he needs to be crated or in a pen, a smaller area, kind of like what I was talking about with the kitchen. Like it might be too big. And so you take down the space to try to encourage them to hold it longer um, until they have access to their potty spot. In some cases with people who are using potty pads long-term, they do keep that pad in the pen area. So that way the puppy learns, this is the appropriate spot. It's far enough away from my bed, where I eat, where I play, this is where I go. And then as they physically mature and are able to hold it longer and longer, they earn more freedom, right? And so. I go back to the beginning. I'll make sure the potty training um, full article <laughs> is included in the resources. Um, go back to the beginning and then slowly start to expand that access. But he definitely needs more breaks to his potty pad. Um, and then if he goes, awesome. And he can earn some freedom. But if he doesn't go, he needs to be confined again to really teach him that association. This is the potty spot. I'm going to give you lots of opportunities to be successful, but I'm going to manage your environment so that you're, you're not having accidents um, in the first place. So that's what I would do. Um, her second question is, I try to play fetch, but often our puppy will wander off and not bring me the toy. Any suggestions on how to keep him engaged? Yeah, great question. Um, puppies have attention spans of like this, this much, like two seconds. Um, but also, some dogs don't love fetch. So sometimes when people are like, oh, I want him to play fetch, but he doesn't want to play fetch. I'm like, you could train it, but is your dog having fun, right? So it might not be worth it to worry about teaching him to play, play fetch. You could try things like the flirt pole instead or lots of tug, different kinds of play styles for different dogs. So finding another way to play and engage with him could be an easy option, right? But you can train fetch. Um, and teach it as a, a behavior and put it on cue. Um, you just have to build some value in the toy and you have to get really excited about it. Um, we have resources for this, I think. We have so many We things. certainly do. We have so many things. I will include the step-by-step -step teaching fetch um, so that you can do it uh, if you want. But if he's not into it, just find another game that he's into. Um, as you go. Also, sometimes just changing the type of toy that you're asking them to fetch can also help. Sometimes they're like, no, I don't want to get that thing. I want to get the squeaky, right? Or I want the ball or whatever it might be. So you play around with like what toy you're using, make sure you're excited about it and getting really like crazy and weird. <laughs> like dogs love that, right? I've, I've made a fool of myself in front of clients with their dogs and they're like, wow, they're so excited to see you. I'm like, yeah, because I act like a weirdo. So, you know, see if you can get them engaged with your excitement. Um, and just play around with it. And then I'll, I'll include the how to play fetch or how to teach fetch um, article as well. Love it. Okay. Um, okay. This will be our last one from Brenda. Um, and you do not have to read the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> it is a very long question. It is a long one, but um, I'll, I'll see where I can cut some, some stuff I, up. Okay. I will cut it for you while you read. <laughs> oh, well, that might be difficult, but I'm up for <laughs> challenge. Okay. <laughs> we have a two-year-old male pit lab mix named Bruno. Oh, Bruno. We rescued him from a shelter when he was five months old. Um, he had been in a large family with four other dogs and three children, including a baby. He's a very social, he's very social and loves people and pets. We even have two guinea pigs that he's very gentle with. He shares food, water, and toys with other dogs. He is with me and my husband at home all day because we're both teachers. 
We find that he's becoming unpredictable in his reactions to dogs and people and are concerned. Most always, he is loving, kind, and sweet to everyone. But lately, when we take him to restaurants that allow us to have him sit outside with us, he growls at certain dogs or people that walk by. At the dog park, Without provocation, he growls at a certain dog, but plays with others. If I'm walking and a dog is across the street, one he'll ignore, two he'll wag his tail and want to visit, or three he'll growl and lunge towards. I'm becoming anxious about taking him anywhere and fearful he might hurt another dog or person and, embar and am embarrassed by his outbursts of growling. My husband and I have suggested it is my own anxiety or the masks people wear or the mannerisms of some people. Others have suggested certain dogs give out an energy he might not like. I don't know if any of those ideas could be true. I don't know if this unpredictable behavior is actually a pattern I can't recognize. I don't know how to correct him after calming him down. I certainly don't know how to prevent it since I can't read the sudden outburst. He does react this way consistently to huskies and large standard poodles. Skateboarders and runners moving quickly past us and people who express fear. Will your dog hurt me? We'll change him quickly to a growler. The growling is similar to when he's guarding the house. He loves to look out the window and watch the world go by. If certain people walk in front of the house, he growls and barks protectively lunging. He doesn't do this with everyone. Sorry, I couldn't cut anything. I was reading through it and I'm like, nope, that's relevant. That's yeah. relevant. No, she took us on a journey. I was in yeah, it. It's a like good background. Um, so first thing I would say is connect with a certified behavior consultant um, or a certified trainer who specializes in reactivity or aggression. I do, but if you want someone who is in your area, uh, let me know. Um, email us and we will find you a referral. It's something that it could be protectiveness, right? It also could be a natural move towards being less sociable, which is fine. It happens with dogs. It happens with humans. Like I was way more sociable in my 20s than I am now. Um, like now the idea of going to a club terrifies me. Um, so, you know, give me a library. <laughs> so what a, what a professional will do is one, they'll ask for a veterinary check to make sure there's not any pain always um, or other underlying conditions Two, they'll start looking at his body language um, and start teaching her how to read his body language because there might be some very subtle signs of when he's starting to get uncomfortable or becoming more protective or territorial and those things one can give us a way to preemptively work on it and proactively work on it and also give us an idea of what is the underlying cause for the behavior, right? Um, and so kind of mapping that out. And then the other thing that a trainer will do with you is um, looking at the pattern. Sometimes there's a pattern, sometimes there's not. But if we start tracking it and like <laughs> certified trainers are obsessed with data. <laughs> so like we love our little charts, like we will collect data and see if there is a pattern because that will change how we address the problem and how we create training setups for the behavior modification that we're going to do. And it also helps us track progress, right? So, so starting to track what, what did happen, like when did it happen? What kind of triggers in the environment did we see? Things like that. We did a yappy hour <laughs> about leash reactivity and triggers. I'll include that in the resources because that's a really good idea of what, what to start doing while you search to connect with a professional. Um, but the first thing I would do is if it feels unpredictable, stop putting them in situations where it could happen. Um, so not going to the dog park, right? Because the last thing you want is for him to start something or warn off another dog and that dog's like, bring it. And then you have a dog fight and all of the legal issues and liability issues that come along with that. If a dog is injured and heaven forbid he's injured or the other dog is injured, you don't want that. So you want to prevent those situations from happening, which means not going to the dog park. Or if you're at the dog park 
and he's fine with one or two of his buddies that he knows and you have a good play history with, and then some new dog comes in, you leave for the day, right? You're really managing the environment to prevent that behavior from happening um, and to keep him safe and other, other dogs safe. The other thing is, is if it's not predictable and you have them with you at a restaurant, that is opening you up to a lot of liability if he does actually bite someone. So, and again, you also don't want him to practice the behavior over and over again. So a lot of this is starting with managing the environment, right? Preventing him from feeling the need to do that. And then a trainer is gonna start you on a behavior modification plan, which works on counter conditioning and desensitization. So changing emotional responses to certain triggers. So certain things, skateboarders. Runners and skateboarders never surprise me as triggers for reactivity, whether it's anxiety-based, fear-based, or territorial, they're moving things, right? So a lot of dogs immediately get into the this brain space of, I wanna chase that, I wanna get that, right? Or it startles them. So easy to identify trigger, right? But we a train would really wanna make sure what else is there that I need to plan for and that I need to counter condition with this dog and teach them what to do instead, right? And really help their brain stay calm and learn that these things are fine right? They're not anything I need to worry about. They're not anything I need to protect my owner about. Um, whatever that underlying cause is starting to address it in that context. Um, but really the trainer is going to help you learn body language um, so that you can identify before any growling happens. And a lot of times too, my reactivity cases always turn into some human coaching of teaching people how to tell people no, you can't pet him. No, you can't say hi. Like kind of helping you manage his environment so that you can still take him out and about and have a fulfilling life, um, but manage his space safely um, and protect him and protect other people and other dogs. Um, but honestly, with a lot of my reactivity cases, I, I talk to my clients about your dog can have a very fulfilling and enriched life at home. They don't need to be going to restaurants with you. They don't need to be going to the dog park if it's creating these behavior issues, um, especially with possible aggressive behaviors because um, you do not want to be a part of a lawsuit for dog bites. They are no fun. So, so yeah, it's a really in-depth behavior modification plan. The yappy hour talks a lot about it, but it is also one of my specialties. So if she wants to connect um, with me or get a referral for someone closer to her, I am more than happy uh, to find someone because that is, it's important to address now before it gets worse. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome, Kathy. Um, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here with us. And, uh, and Donna, stick on for a minute. I want to make sure you got the answer to your question that you emailed about. Hang out with me afterwards. <laughs> But yes, thank you so much, everyone. I will make sure this is all rendered for you and all of your resources. It's going to be just information overload. Um, but if you have other questions that we didn't get to and you want answered or that you thought of, just respond to that email um, and I will write you back. And then we will have another Yappy Hour in January. 2020 will be over and it's awesome. <laughs> I can't I wait. So. <laughs> this year for sure. This year for sure. For sure. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.